likely to find genetically engineered foods at the ballot box and the supermarket. After nearly 20 years of eating them, questions persist. How should they be regulated? If you have nothing to hide, go ahead and label. People want to know, go ahead and tell them. How do they impact the environment? It just has one gene that's different, that allows us to use uh, a very safe and very effective herbicide. And how badly do we need them? We are telling the plant, whenever there is drought, make more of this gene. Coming up, how genetically engineered foods could shape our next meal. modified foods and I for one am very excited about this. Two days before the November 2012 election, supporters of Proposition 37 rallied in downtown Santa Cruz, California. If it passed, the initiative would make California the first state to require the labeling of foods that contain genetically engineered ingredients. Hi, are you voting yes on Proposition 37? Absolutely. This is not about any corporations on our side or anything. It's just the citizens against these chemical and junk food corporations. Monsanto and Dow shouldn't be able to hide that they are genetically engineering our food. 61 other countries already have the right to know, shouldn't we? Yes. What I didn't like about it was that it brought with it an implication that somehow these GM foods uh, were themselves dangerous or bad in some regard, and that was the hidden or even not so hidden agenda of, of the proponents of 37. They weren't in favor of labeling, they were in favor of stopping GM food. Under Prop 37's complex, badly written label regulations. A coalition of seed and food companies like Monsanto and Pepsi, as well as farmers and grocery owners, went on the offensive against the initiative. And it would increase costs for California farmers and food companies by over a billion dollars per year. In the end, the initiative received 49% of the vote. Not enough to win, but enough to signal that six million Californians aren't completely comfortable with genetically engineered foods. For biologists working in the field, genetic engineering is one more tool to continue improving foods we've been tinkering with for thousands of years. The ancestor of corn was something like that, that you could not eat. The ancestors of tomatoes were the size of my thumb, and they tasted very bad. And breathing gave us what we have right now. So classical breeding basically involves taking the female eggs from one plant and bringing them together with the male parts of another plant. Uh, and then all that genetic information gets mixed up. With genetic engineering, it's just moving very small parts of that genetic information and pulling it out in a very precise way and then pasting it back into the, so you might take it out of one plant and move it into another plant. But ever since big companies like Monsanto started selling genetically engineered seeds in the mid-90s, questions have persisted. How safe are genetically engineered foods? Do they harm the environment? How badly do we need them? It was a monumental blunder the way this technology was rolled out. They marketed it to the farmers, the farmers saw the benefit, but to do something as intimate as, as our experience with food, we put it into our own bodies, we feed our children, and they trust, you know, we want to trust our food. They introduced something that people thought was messing around with their food without giving them any benefit in return. But I think a piece of this has been first, um, was something that's new, uh, was something that you know, brings controversy with it. Monsanto genetically engineered one category of crops to fend off agricultural pests by inserting a gene from a type of bacterium that kills certain insects. This cut the use of insecticides in those crops. The company designed a second category of engineered crops that could resist its Roundup herbicide. 
The idea was to kill the weeds, but not the crops, when Roundup was sprayed. So Monsanto engineered soybeans and other crops to tolerate Roundup. With these new Roundup-ready crops, farmers could now more easily use Roundup herbicide, which was cheaper and less toxic than other herbicides. Today, about 90% of the sugar beets, cotton, corn, and soybeans grown in the United States are genetically engineered. Around the world, roughly half of all cotton and soybeans are engineered. So what genetically engineered foods might you find at the supermarket? If you buy organic food, none, because the U.S. Department of Agriculture does not allow organic farmers to knowingly use genetically engineered seeds, animal feed, or ingredients. Most genetically engineered corn and soybeans go to feeding livestock and producing ethanol. Some soybeans, corn, and sugar beets end up in snack foods and cereals in the form of soy lecithin, corn syrup, and sugar. A little yellow crookneck squash and zucchini, some varieties of Hawaiian papayas, and some sweet corn are also genetically engineered. All of these really are engineered to help the farmer. So they're, they, they either protect them against insects or viral diseases, or they protect them against certain herbicides. But it wasn't always this way. The very first genetically engineered food sold in the world was designed to appeal to consumers. The Flavor Saver Tomato was created in Davis, California by a biotech company called Calgene. The idea was to create a tomato that would be tasty and remain firm for transportation. The genetic engineering had eliminated or greatly reduced an enzyme that is responsible for softening tomatoes. And so if they would stay firmer on the vine, then you could let them start to ripen on their own and they would start to get all the tomato flavors that you would get in your backyard. The Food and Drug Administration, after five years of study, has said this thing is totally safe and what we're going to do is provide that information to the consumers and let them make a choice. Flavor Saver tomatoes were marketed under the name McGregor's and labeled as genetically engineered. Here in Davis, the store owner took to rationing them because he couldn't keep them on the shelves. But the Flavor Saver gene didn't keep tomatoes firm on the vine. And after Calgene expanded too fast, it meant the end of the McGregor's. In 1996, Monsanto bought Calgene. Flavor Saver tomatoes were also made into a tomato paste, which sold well in England. But much of Europe quickly turned against genetically engineered crops. And destroyed at least two thirds of the crop. This was partly because these foods were introduced in the mid 1990s, when the European public was in a panic over human deaths caused by mad cow disease. People started being more worried about how safe their foods were and government agencies, and, and um, were they doing an adequate enough job uh, keeping the food supply safe? We will not allow to be contaminated with engineered genes for the short-term profit of a handful of multinational corporations. Thank you. Yeah. Europeans have different outlook on food. They look at it in a very historical way. They like it the way it was yesterday. And, and so it was changing. And not only was it changing, it was a change that was coming from the outside. It was something coming from the United States. Today, scientists in Northern California are using genetic engineering to try to solve global problems. At the University of California, Berkeley, biologist Peggy Lameau is genetically engineering a cereal called sorghum. 300 million people in Africa eat sorghum porridge every day, and often little else. Many people in developing countries don't have markets that they can go to and, you know, pick out this vegetable, that vegetable, and get all their vitamins and minerals that way. And so what you want to do is make whatever it is that they eat, sorghum in this case, uh, a complete nutritional package. What few nutrients sorghum does have are difficult to digest. With initial funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Lameau and her team are engineering sorghum to change this. 
Lameau is tweaking a gene in sorghum seeds so that it produces 20 times more of a protein that makes the plant easier to digest. And she wants to keep that protein stored away in the seed until it's milled into flour and cooked, something she can only do through genetic engineering. So when we're ready to genetically engineer sorghum, we will open up the, the seed uh, and we will pluck out that very tiny little immature embryo. A member of Lameau's team mixes a group of embryos with a liquid containing a type of soil bacterium that transports the tweaked sorghum gene into the embryo. The process is similar for other crops. Over a period of time, you select only those cells that got that genetic information, and it grows up as a sort of an amorphous mass. It sort of looks like a bunch of, of grits uh, on a plate. Uh, and then, miraculously, using plant hormones, you can cue that mass of cells to say, remember, you're a plant. And it goes, oh, yeah. It grows up, and every cell in that plant now will have that piece of genetic information that you put into it. So when we actually ran the gel and saw this protein here, which is the, the protein from the gene that we introduced, we were all very, very excited. And we were cheering uh, because it's actually making the protein that's going to do the job uh, on digestibility. Around the world, scientists have successfully engineered different crops to improve nutrition. But farmers aren't growing any yet. In 1999, Swiss and German scientists created a rice that produces vitamin A, a nutrient lacking in the diets of one-third of the world's small children. The vitamin gives the rice an orange hue and led to the name golden rice. It's been shown to, to work. In other words, if people do eat it or animals eat it, they do get the vitamin A. The vitamin prevents severe infections and blindness. But before farmers can grow it in Asia, it has to go through a lengthy review process. There's pressure from outside groups that aren't fans of genetic engineering on regulatory bodies to be careful and to want to do a lot of feeding studies and so forth to make sure that something is safe. The rice could be available to farmers in the Philippines and Bangladesh in 2015. Here in the United States, CalGene pioneered regulations of genetically engineered foods when it took its flavor saver tomato to the FDA in the early 90s. What the company wanted to show was that the tomato was safe. That was the bottom line. Oftentimes, using this technology, a dozen genes or, or half a dozen genes will be inserted at various places um, in the tomato genome or any plant genome. So the potential there was that the gene could land in a tomato gene and disrupt it, thereby mutating it. Genetic mutations could, for example, lead to a spike in unwanted plant chemicals that could cause health problems. So biologists look in each plant to see if any genes were disrupted. If anything looks odd or different or looks like it might have an issue, then we don't use those plants. So we choose those that we're confident that they're not going to cause changes uh, in, to the food quality or the food safety. Companies that sell genetically engineered seeds in the United States need approval from the EPA and USDA for most seeds. They also regularly go before the FDA, though that process is voluntary, which has drawn criticism. It should be required for every genetically engineered crop um, that's going to be a food product, um, the company should have to go to the FDA and it, and it submit certain studies. But scientists like Lameau say that regulations as they stand today are excessive and hold back research. California has three, more than 300 different crops. Wow, what I could do to help agriculture in California but it really just isn't feasible because it's much too costly. You have to do a lot of regulatory tests and we just simply don't have the money. I encourage everyone to come up and take a commemorative picture, have your picture taken as the, uh, a corn dog or an insecticodfish or the tomato fish. Given current regulations, should consumers be wary of the safety of genetically engineered foods? Though activists portray them as half animal, half plant, this is more fiction than fact. 
Research was done in 1991 by a company in Oakland, California, to insert a fish gene into a tomato to make it more tolerant to cold weather. But it didn't work, and the tomato was never sold. I may eat a, a fish dish that has tomato sauce all over it. So I'm eating fish genes and tomato genes all together in my stomach. So if you want to take that gene out of a fish and stick it into a tomato, I, it doesn't bother me, but it does, it, it just, it's unsettling to some people. Lemo writes and gives talks for the University of California. She doesn't take any money from biotech companies for this outreach work. I, I have personally gone through the safety studies that are available to look at uh, on the crops that are out there now. Uh, and my conclusion was from looking at those that I did not see any indication that there were health safety issues associated in a, in a specific way with any genetically engineered food or crop that's out there now. The World Health Organization and the U.S. National Academies have stated that the genetically engineered foods available today are safe to eat. Other concerns are playing out in the fields of California's Central Valley. The latest genetically engineered large-scale crop to be approved in the United States is alfalfa, which is made into hay for dairy cows. There is a reason why they call this alfalfa the queen of forages, because it has both the fiber and the protein uh, uh, that the animal needs inside of it. In Las Banas, Philip Bowles has switched almost entirely to growing genetically engineered alfalfa. This alfalfa tolerates the herbicide Roundup, so farmers can kill the weeds in their fields easily. You notice there's no weeds at all. It's in totally this. clean. This is what the dairymen want. This is what they pay the big money for. Farmers can get $75 more per ton of clean alfalfa hay than for weedy hay. That's one of the reasons why in California, the nation's leading dairy state, about half of alfalfa farmers are now growing Roundup Ready alfalfa, even though the seeds are more expensive and they're patented. You can't save the seed, you can't resell it to third parties. It's Monsanto's seed. They, I didn't develop the seed, they developed it, and so I'm free to buy it or not buy it as I see fit. Bull sees health and environmental advantages to planting Roundup Ready crops. With Roundup Ready, we replaced two herbicides, uh, one of which was very persistent in the soil and one of which is actually quite dangerous to the people who apply it. The EPA classifies Roundup and similar herbicides as low in toxicity. As a result of the popularity of Roundup Ready crops, it has become the country's most used herbicide. But around the U.S., 10 species of weeds have developed resistance to Roundup. You can't use the same chemistry all the time or you're going to be breeding resistant weeds. Everybody knows the proper weed stewardship and this has nothing to do with Roundup or Roundup Ready. You have to rotate herbicides. With weed resistance, some farmers have increased spraying and seen their profits drop. Seed companies have responded by developing crops that can resist herbicides other than Roundup. As the popularity of genetically engineered crops has spread, organic farmers have become increasingly nervous. In California's Marin County, organic dairy farmer Albert Strauss discovered in 2005 that around 2% of his organic corn feed was genetically engineered. Over 90% of our consumers did not want GMOs in their, in their food. And when they were genetically modified, modified ingredients that are going into our products, I'm, it, it doesn't feel right to me and I want to make it right and I want to be truthful or a consumer. The USDA doesn't have a threshold for contamination of organic feed, but Strauss has had his dairy products certified to be GMO free by a nonprofit in Washington state. To keep this certification, only 1% of his feed can be genetically engineered. Today, he's testing his alfalfa hay. If it's a positive, you're supposed to see two um, different lines. It's very difficult for alfalfa hay uh, to become contaminated in the field because we cut the alfalfa before it flowers. So the contamination that Mr. Strauss is worried about could possibly come from a truck uh, that had some, some Roundup Ready hay on it and there would be a few twigs or, or little leaves or pieces. We didn't get the second line, so we know that 
this specimen is negative for genetic modification. This, this is a good result. But for Strauss, genetically engineered crops are a lightning rod for what he views as big agriculture's shortcomings. We lose 5%, 5 to 10% of our dairy farms every year because it's not a sustainable system. It's not economically viable. Farms get bigger and bigger to try to offset costs. Then it's not ecologically sound. Pesticides, herbicides are not sustainable. They're not healthy for land and they're not healthy for people and cows. Some fear that the sheer size of seed companies could be contributing to reducing crop diversity. The USDA estimated in 2011 that four large companies, Monsanto, DuPont Pioneer, Syngenta, and Lima Grain, sold more than half of all the seeds commercialized in the world. Monsanto argues that it introduces its genetic traits in many different varieties of a particular crop. We grow about 90 million acres of corn in the US. Inside that 90 million acres, we sell um, about 300 varieties of corn. If you went to the seed catalog for Monsanto, there's about 300 uh, corn varieties in there. And within that 300, there's genetic diversity. Though 300 varieties of corn might sound like a lot, some scientists fear that it might not be enough. I think the number of varieties that are being given to farmers to grow is, is getting smaller and I think we've, we've seen that with uh, the corn blight several decades ago where the genetic diversity was very small and a disease found, oh, I can attack that plant and then, you know, they lost most of the corn that year. And I, I certainly don't want that to happen again. Some California researchers actually see genetic engineering as a tool to make the state's agriculture more sustainable. At the University of California, Davis, Eduardo Blumwald and his team are engineering rice to tolerate the droughts that are already becoming more common with climate change. In California in particular, water is very, very expensive, and we don't have it. When you go to the valleys, we are irrigating, but that irrigation is becoming more and more and more expensive. We chose a gene from rice that regulates how much sugar goes to the seeds from the roots. We are telling the plant, whenever there is drought, make more of this gene, nothing else. This is the normal rice plant after seven days with no water whatsoever, the seeds are absolutely empty. You can see no content, they are full of air. On the other hand, you can see that the transgenic plant is growing maybe not as good as a normal plant, but yet we can get 70%, more or less than 70% of the grains that we could get in very well water conditions. As the anti-GE food movement moves on from its loss at California's ballot, there's some indication that Monsanto and big retailers like Walmart may be willing to discuss a national labeling standard. I think it's in the best interest of the industry itself, actually, to label. If you have nothing to hide, um, go ahead and label. People want to know. Uh, go ahead and tell them. Meanwhile, many researchers warn activists that we're going to need every tool available to adapt to climate change. They're wrong in confusing their animosity against the companies and translating that to the animosity against genetically modified organisms and transgenic crops. Genetic engineering is one of the tools which are absolutely needed to generate enough food for our population for the next 50 years. From earthquakes to astronauts, brains to bats, whales to wind, we're on a quest to tell the most compelling stories from communities around the nation and reveal the science hiding just beneath the surface. Learn more at kqed.org slash quest.
Support for Quest is provided by the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation, the David B. Gold Foundation, the Dirk and Charlene Cabsonell Foundation, the Vedez Family Foundation, the Wincote Foundation, the Amgen Foundation, and the George G. and Jeanette A. Stewart Charitable Trust. Support is also provided by the members of KQED.